Iceland. Land of volcanoes, glaciers, rugged landscapes, and the midnight sun. Iceland is unique. Nowhere in the world have I seen anything even close to this nature spectacle between the vast Arctic Sea and the North Atlantic Ocean. Iceland is a celebration of nature, and the forces of the elements here are humbling. Never have I felt closer to the Earth's core than on this trip, and never have I seen more splendor of fresh water gushing down over steep cliffs. The ever-present geological activity, the bubbling and hissing of sulfuric gases, the majestic craters that are silent and awe-inspiring remnants of past cataclysmic outbursts are eerie reminders that the next volcanic eruption is always near. Located right over two tectonic plates, the fissures lay wide open for visitors to see. But Iceland also tells a story of life in seemingly inhabitable lands. A story of unique and rare fauna that graces the island with sporadic visits at its rough shores. And of course, there are the graceful Icelandic horses and sheep. Lots of sheep. They would accompany me throughout my road trip. But let's get started. Join me on my 10-day journey all across this majestic Nordic island. Discover the seemingly endless highlights of the famous ring road that circles the island. Experience the rugged, vast interior landscapes, some of which are only accessible with 4x4 vehicles in the summer season. Accompany me on the most iconic hikes in the Icelandic mountains. And join me as I explore the splendor of the forgotten West Fjords in the northwestern part of the island. This is the story of my Grand Iceland Road Trip. I arrived in Reykjavik's International Airport, which is situated an hour drive outside Iceland's capital city on the Kafavik Peninsula in the very southeast of the island. Iceland greeted me with cloudy weather, interrupted briefly by some sun rays forcing their way through the cloudy layers. I headed straight to the rental car agency where I picked up my 4x4 vehicle, a Dutch Head Duster, which I had already booked prior to arriving. The best way to explore the island is with a 4x4, as it allows you to take the infamous F-roads rugged gravel roads that lead through the highlands in the interior of the country and that require four-wheel powered vehicles, preferably with a higher clearance. But if you plan to stay on the asphalt roads of the ring road, then a traditional camper may be your vehicle of choice. My original plan had been to visit the island counterclockwise, but the weather forecast convinced me otherwise. Most of the south of the island would be blessed by heavy rainfall and thunderstorms over the coming week, and I decided to spontaneously change my plans to embark on my journey by first visiting the hidden gem of the island, the West Fjords. Icelandic weather has its own character and it determines the travel agenda at any given day, not the traveler. After filling my trunk with some essential food supplies at Bonus, one of the most frequented discount supermarkets in the country, I set out to visit Reykjavik, Iceland's vibrant capital city. Reykjavik is by far the largest city of Iceland and over two thirds of Iceland's population live in the capital area. The world's northernmost capital of a sovereign state is believed to be the location of the first permanent settlement in Iceland, which dates back all the way to the year 874. But it should take another 900 years until the city was officially founded in 1786 as a trading town. It grew steadily ever since and today makes for a perfect starting point for any Iceland trip. Reykjavik is Iceland's cultural, economic and political center and is among the cleanest, greenest and safest cities in the world. A great starting point for a city walk is the famous Hattelgrimskirkja, the church of Hattelgrimur, named after 17th century poet Hattelgrimur Peterson. Known for its distinctively curved spire and side wings, the Lutheran parish church, with a height of 74.5 meters, about 244 feet, is among the tallest structures in the country. The space in front of the church is graced by an imposing statue of the 10th century explorer Leif Eriksson, also known as Leif the Lucky. The statue was a gift from the United States commemorating the thousand-year anniversary of the convening of Iceland's parliament at Thingvellir in the year 930. 
Leif Eriksson is thought to have been the first European to set foot on continental North America approximately half a millennium before Christopher Columbus. Marveling at the statue and church, I couldn't help but notice the many inviting food trucks that frame the square. I was hungry and decided to have my first culinary experience in form of a pulled lamb hot dog. It may have been the most expensive hot dog of my life, but it was certainly utmost delicious. From the church square, which sits on the hill overlooking the city, I took one of the historical streets down to the lower harbor area, passing the picturesque Rainbow Street. Reykjavik's streets are a feast for the eyes, with the many colorful local shops and boutiques that compete for attention only with the many eclectic restaurants, cafes and bars. The latter have acquired notable fame beyond the country and many feature local and international live music. After strolling through the harbor area, where large ships are flanked by ultra-modern building facades and the seamen of the Looking Seaward statue are gazing out towards the ocean, I decided to head back to my car and embark on my road trip, heading northward to the West Fjords, a region of abundant beauty and wilderness, as I should soon find out. Leaving the capital area, it became quickly apparent how few people there are on the islands. With only about 370,000 inhabitants, Iceland is one of the most sparsely populated countries in the world, and something else caught my attention. Apart from the occasional birch, I hardly saw any trees. Formerly covering the island in abundance, trees and forests have been almost eradicated from the island after the Vikings had settled here in the 9th century. Nowadays, the government is engaging in reforestation programs to raise the percentage of tree coverage from a meager 1.5% to 5% in the next 50 years, a both noble and ambitious target. My first stop were the majestic Gerdeberg Cliffs, located at the southern entrance of the Snæfellsnes Peninsula, about one and a half hours north of the capital. The imposing vertical wall of perfectly shaped hexagonal basalt columns that run along a long cliff looked like they were hand chiseled. A short climb up to the cliff reveals a stupendous view of the landscape below that I only shared with a couple of grazing sheep. Further away, I made out the distinctive shape of my first Icelandic volcanic crater, the Elborg Crater. I continued on the gravel road to reach Radamelskirkja, where more sheep gave me a warm welcome. By now, it was way past 10 o'clock in the evening, but despite the heavy layer of clouds above me, it was still bright daylight. I was clearly in the land of the midnight sun. Iceland is located just below the Arctic Circle, and my visit here coincided with the longest days of the year. I was determined to make the most of it and see as much as I could every day. While I would miss out on the Nordic lights, which can only be seen during the winter months between September and March, when the night sky gets sufficiently dark, I would find traveling Iceland in the summer such a rewarding experience, as the daylight hours quite literally never stop. I continued my journey to the shores of Ichutunga, graced by rare golden sand beaches. This would be the place to see seals that often lounge on the rocks. Unfortunately, the weather quickly deteriorated and heavy rainfall set in, but I nevertheless made my way past a whale skeleton across the beach to the adjacent rocks, where I indeed spotted a few harbor seals that took their bath and characteristically rubbed their backs against the large rocks. To protect the habitat of these wondrous animals, visitors are asked to keep 100 meters distance. Harbor seals are the most common seal species in the Icelandic waters. They weigh between 90 and 100 kilograms and are about 1.6 to 1.7 meters long. They feed off cod, redfish, sand eel, herring and various other fish and feed at the depth of 10 to 50 meters. But they occasionally dive up to 200 meters deep and can stay underwater for up to 25 minutes. Gazing beyond the seals, I marveled at the serene scenery that was accentuated by the soothing sound of the waves hitting against the black round rocks. It was good to be in Iceland. (coughs) 
Not far from Itritunga stands the iconic black church of Budir. Budir is a small hamlet located in the Budahaun lava fields in Sadarsvet, where Kraunhaf Narao falls into the sea. The small church is a much appreciated motive for photographers as the black and white paint of the church contrasts with the emerald green grass all around it. The church building was closed when I was there, but the surroundings invited me for a walk that led through the lava fields on both sides of a small trail. During the day, the site can get quite crowded, but by now, the clock had passed the midnight hour and I had the scenery all to myself. My last stop of the day was not far from the gorge at the small fishing village of Onastapi at the foot of Mount Stapafetl, where I stayed for the night and fell asleep right away. Arnastapi lies right at the majestic sea cliffs of Snæfellsnes rocky coastline and boasts some of the most fascinating cliff formations of all of Iceland. The diversity of shapes the rough seas have cut inside the rock are simply stunning. I greeted the morning soaking in the fresh air as I walked along the narrow trail that at every turn seemed to reveal a new nature spectacle made of arches, stacks and long inlets. The cliffs are made of basalt columns holding colonies of seabirds that seemed surprisingly at ease with the rough power of the elements with gushing water hitting against the rocks. Heading inwards, towards the village again, I spotted the eye-catching statue of Bardor, an iconic giant troll that has its place in Icelandic mythology. My next stop was at the eerie ruins of Dagverdara. Situated in the middle of the vast grassland, this abandoned farm clearly has seen better times. Years ago, the owners passed away and nobody seemed to be willing to take care of the house. Nowadays, only graffiti artists and photographers come to appreciate this increasingly dilapidated and slightly spooky place. Just a few minutes further west, I spotted the imposing sea stacks of the Londrangar cliffs. Forcing myself against the heavy wind gushes that turned raindrops into spiky thorns on the skin, I walked up the gravel path to the lookout on the high cliffs. From here, I had a scenic view across the coastal shore to the massive basalt cliffs and the rock formation that towered over the horizon. Hundreds of seagulls call the crevices in the rocks home and parents feed the ever-hungry stomachs of their crying younglings come rain or come shine. Today, however, Iceland opted for rain and I decided to seek shelter in the comforting shell of my 4x4. It should be the perfect moment to go on my next excursion, the breathtakingly beautiful black beach of Jupalansandar. This enchanting bay was once home to 60 fishing boats and one of the most prolific fishing villages on the Snæfellsnes Peninsula, but now the place was abandoned and uninhabited. The rusty remains of a British fishing trawler shipwreck, the Epine GY7 from Grimsby, tell the story of a 1948 tragic accident which left 14 dead with only 5 survivors. But the real reason for me to come here were the marvelous contrasting colors of the seagrass, shimmering rocks and shells on the dark glistening black beach. The endless display of nature's unique idiosyncrasies make Jupalasandau beach a photographer's paradise.
continued my journey along the most western side of the Sneifelsnes Peninsula, passing more lava fields, to eventually enter a rough gravel road that took me all the way to the bright orange lighthouse of Svertuloft. As soon as I left the car, a heavy gust of wind hit my body, announcing the full exposure of this place to the elements. The lighthouse dates back to the year 1931 when it replaced an earlier iron structure from 1941. Today, it is entirely powered by solar energy. For the many birds here, Svertuloft is a paradise. It's the home of Brinix guillemots, razorbills, kittiwakes, fulmars, shags, blackback gulls, and the occasional puffin. But now most of the birds were likely at sea to feed, and only some of the 3,000 kittiwakes that call Svertuloft home drew circles above the cliffs. The formation of the dark lava cliff is truly spectacular, and the natural arc by the lighthouse with the stack that stands up from the sea line is awe-inspiring. Despite the heavy winds here, I was glad to have made the detour to this remote place on the peninsula. Tracing my way back on the gravel road, I stopped at the golden sand beach of Skartsvik. This secluded beach, leading into glimmering emerald waters, could easily be situated in the Caribbean, were it not for the bold black lava rock formations that frame the beach on all sides. But the beach holds another secret. It was here where in the summer of 1962 a Viking grave of an 18 to 25 year old male was found. In addition to the remains, the grave contained a sword, a spearhead, a shield, knife and other pieces of iron. Contemplating about what may have been the cause of death at such a young age, I walked along the beach, soaking in some fresh air that was accompanied by some rare sun rays that briefly interrupted the rain drizzle. I continued my journey along the northern coastline of Sneifettelsnes, where the weather quickly deteriorated again and heavy rainfall and ever intense winds made it difficult to even open the door of my car. But the magnificent scenery of the famous lupine fields of Hetlisandaur with the iconic Ingalls Holzkirche in the background prompted me to pause and venture outside. Lupines are the most common flower of Iceland and can be spotted all over the island in the summer months from June to July, when the distinct purple color is in full bloom. They can grow up to 120 centimeters in height and are known for their fast spreading nature, which usually leads to them creating vast blankets of color when they bloom. The local kind here is the Alaskan lupine, which was introduced to Iceland in 1945 in an effort to revegetate the island. Haukon Bjarnarsson, an Icelander, took a trip to Alaska to select plants he thought would do well in the harsh Icelandic landscape. He brought a few seeds of lupine with him and, well, the rest is history. Throughout the centuries, Kirkjufettel's striking slopes have acted as a visual landmark for seafarers and travelers. Peaking at 463 meters, about 1519 feet, Kirkjufettel is a truly impressive landmark and it is one of the most photographed mountains in Iceland. The name Kirkjufettel means church mountain in Icelandic, as the mountain's shape resembles a church steeple. I took the short walk from the mountain to the serene and perfectly located waterfall Kirkjufettelsfoss, from where the most iconic photos are framed with the mountain as a dramatic background. Despite its relatively diminutive height, Kirkjufettel's Foss three steps and gentle flow make it just as impressive as some of Iceland's larger waterfalls. Just a short drive further down the road, I made a brief stop and enjoyed yet another fantastic view of the mountain. A few minutes further east, I crossed the lava rock field of Berserkerhran. As far as the eye can see, unfolds a seemingly endless sea of mossy rocks that gently cover the scenery as puffy waves that appear frozen in time. This field originated from four prominent craters that erupted about 3,600 to 4,000 years ago, creating a lava flow between the mountainside and the sea. When it finally cooled down, it created this breathtaking landscape. One must not step inside the lava fields, as the moss takes many years to recover from any physical disturbances visitors may bring about. I enjoyed the dramatic view that was further enhanced by the low clouds and rain drizzles that tried to chase away the afternoon sun. From here, I embarked on a long drive to the famous wilderness of the West Fjords, with the dramatic landscapes, rugged mountains and rough weather that altogether made for an unforgettable journey.
After several hours, I arrived at a secluded bay on the Patrick's Fjordar shoreline. This enchanting bay became the final resting place of an old whale traveler, the Garthar BA-64. Built in a Norwegian shipyard in 1912, in reaching Iceland in 1950, the Garthar BA-64 is Iceland's oldest steel ship. It features a reinforced hull for it to forge ahead through icy seas, while its strong engine kept it sailing through stormy waters. When whaling restrictions increased, the Garthar BA-64 became a herring fishing boat. And in 1981, due to mounting safety concerns, the ship retired after a long and respected career. It found its final resting place here at the Bay of Patrick's Fjordar, which is well known for its fishing industry and is still the primary source of the region's income and livelihood of local communities up to today. The Bay was a truly peaceful place and I enjoyed the soothing atmosphere together with a colony of ducks that took their evening bath in the icy cold waters of the fjord. The last stretch of my journey today should take me higher up into the mountains of the West Fjords again. A breathtakingly beautiful drive on rough and narrow roads that seemed endless but should take me to one of the most remote places on the island. Latrabjarg is Iceland's largest sea cliff that stretches an astonishing 14 kilometers, about 9 miles, and peaks at a height of 440 meters, almost 1500 feet. This majestic cliff claim to fame is that it is the westernmost point in Europe and hosts Iceland's greatest concentration of seabirds. The variety and sheer number of birds that can be seen in Lachebark at one time is astounding. My primary goal, however, was to see some of the many iconic puffins that have their nesting grounds in the narrow crevices of the cliffs. Safe from Arctic foxes, the puffins here are more fearless than in most other places on the island. Latrabjarg might be one of the best places in the world to see the cute creatures with their bright colored packs and funny walks. They usually come back to the cliffs in the late evening hours after long days of fishing out in the sea. I came at the right time of the year. The puffin season in Latrabjarg starts from the middle of May and lasts until late August. The unrestricted access during nesting season provide me with ample opportunities to take pictures at a close range. Puffins beat their wings up to 400 times per minute in swift flight, often flying quite low over the ocean surface. Several puffins joined me at the cliffs and did not mind my presence. The puffins observed the scenery around them, some shaking their heads in disbelief how lucky they were to nest on these high cliffs. They proudly presented their colorful orange-red beak and battled along the grassy patches at the edge of the cliffs. Puffins are excellent fish hunters and can hold several small fish in their bills at a time, but now it was night time and they were resting on the rocks from a long day out in the ocean. The peaceful scenery here with the puffins was simply amazing. I observed these graceful animals that slightly resemble small penguins, although they are a completely different bird species. This should be one of the most memorable moments of my trip, as I was all alone with the puffins and the calm and undisturbed atmosphere was soothingly accompanied by the steady sweeping sound of the waves far below the cliffs. The next morning, after a short breakfast and some hot tea, I took the beautiful drive back down to the sea level. The weather was still cloudy and it was way too early for any places to open, including the neat Knjortur Folk Museum located in Orlikshofen. But this did not prevent me from visiting an old US Navy plane that had caught my eye the evening before. A US Navy Douglas C-117D, a version of the Douglas DC-47 Skytrain or Dakota plane which had been used quite extensively by the Allies in the Second World War. But this particular example was decommissioned at the airfield in Keflavik and in 2004 donated to the Folk Museum here when the Keflavik airfield closed down. And while the plane was in a somewhat sorry state, 
as its wings and fuselage were detached from the main body, it was nevertheless a curious find in this remote region and made for some great pictures against the dramatic backdrop of the Icelandic scenery. My main destination for the day were the majestic waterfalls of Dinyandi. But little did I know how beautiful the drive would be over the mountainscapes of the West Fjords. The West Fjords are the oldest part of Iceland. They originated around 14 to 16 million years ago during a series of volcanic eruptions that laid down depositions of successive layers of basalt rock and lava slag with different degrees of hardness. About 10,000 years ago, a long ice age came to an end and as glaciers resided, deep valleys and fjords emerged, surrounded by terraced rock formations. This explains the peculiar terrestrial shapes of the mountains of the West Fjords and makes for the unrivaled beauty of the scenery here. The vistas here were simply stunning and I stopped the car on multiple occasions to soak in the sensational views of this forgotten part of Iceland. The first records of a farm located in Jinjandi date back to the Middle Ages, and farmhouses were inhabited here until the early 1950s. Today, Dinyandi is known to be the largest waterfall and the most spectacular site in the West Fjords. Some even say it's the most majestic and beautiful waterfall in Iceland. Given the competition of literally dozens of spectacular waterfalls on the island, this says a lot. Dinjandi waterfall, which rightfully translates to the Thunderer, is in fact a collection of seven cascades that gush over terraces of basalt boulders and loosely resemble a tiered wedding cake with lots of icing. The Thunderer's power of the main cascade drops 100 meters, about 329 feet, off the edge of a mountain that frames the bay of Janarfjord to three sides. Each of the seven tiers carries a name and it is possible to walk behind the third tier, Gongafoss. The tremendous power of the water masses gushing down fills the air with clouds of fine mist and I was glad to wear some protective water resistant layers. For the first time since I had arrived in Iceland, the sun fully came through the clouds and the lush green landscapes radiated in the sunlight, beautifully contrasting with the dark lava rock formations. I continued my journey, crossing deep valleys and high mountain passes, pausing at the enchanting shores of wondrous fjords and observing birds, sheep and Icelandic horses going about their daily search of nutrients found in the splendor of Iceland's nature. Driving here was nothing but blissful and at every turn I was mesmerized again and again by the ever-changing landscapes that never ceased to amaze.
After several hours of driving, I reached the Vattensnes Peninsula in northwest Iceland. My destination was the majestic monolith of Quitzerkur, a 15 meter tall sea stack that stands some 50 meters offshore. The eroded volcanic dike looks a bit like an elephant or even some sort of a dinosaur waiting in the water. Quitzerkur translates as a white shirt, which may make reference to its white color that is made of layers of bird droppings. The spectacular basalt rock is home to hundreds of seagulls and falmars, and the younglings can be heard from afar as they are crying for food every time an adult flies close to their nest. Below them, a powerful, never-ending onslaught of the tireless sea hits the base of the stack and further erodes it. Legend goes that Quitzerkor is a petrified Icelandic troll that lived in the West Fjords and wanted to tear down the bells at the Thingera Klaustar convent because it didn't like the sound of the church bells. Fortunately for the convent, the troll got caught by the first rays of the sun and turned into a stone at the dawn of the new day. Without this petrification due to the daylight hitting the troll, the sea stack may have never emerged at the shores of Vattensnes. Reminiscing about this legend, I strolled along the beach watching the birds and red clover mites that beautifully contrasted against the dark lava rocks. I still had some ways to drive and had to therefore say goodbye to Quitzerkor. As the day came to an end, the sun refused to disappear and this should make the drive one of the most memorable ones of all my travels. The atmosphere of the changing sky that shimmered in the most tantalizing shades of yellow, rose and purple was breathtaking. The clock hands had moved way past midnight and I gazed into the never disappearing golden red sun, making my way to Iceland's second largest town, Akareri, where I spent the rest of the short night. Early in the morning, I set out to the magnificent waterfalls of Godafoss. This powerful waterfall is one of the most spectacular waterfalls in Iceland. Over a width of 30 meters, the waters of the river Skalfandafljot gush over the edge of a 12 meters high cliff. I took the short walk down to the waterfall from where I had a splendid view of the nature spectacle, which due to the early hour of the day, I was fortunate to have all to myself. The history of the waterfall is connected to the conversion of Icelanders to Christianity. Thorgeir Ljosvetninga Godi, the legal representative of the Althinki pagan tribe in the years around the turn of the first millennium, decided to convert his people to Christianity to appease the larger Norwegian settlers and other European powers. Legend goes that he threw the pagan idols of the old Norse religion gods into the waterfall. The Icelandic word for gods is God, and so the waterfall has been called Godafoss ever since. As a not so fun fact, Thorgeir still allowed the slaughter of children, the eating of horse meat, and swearing as long as it was done in secret. The day was still young when I arrived at the northern coastal town of Husavik that overlooks Kalfandi Bay. 
This enchanting town is the oldest settlement in Iceland and the site where Swedish Viking Garda Svarason built the first house on the island in the year 860. But it was really known as the whale capital of Iceland. It had been a bucket list item for me to go on a whale watching tour and today should be the day I would make it happen. The cold and shaky waters of Skalfandi Bay are home to 23 species of whales including the gigantic blue whale, the largest mammal on earth, and several whale watching companies offer tours of the traditional trawlers. Somehow, whales seem to love the waters here and visitors have a 98% chance of spotting these graceful giants of the seas. I put on the water resistant thick gear and joined a group of about 20 fellow whale watchers to head out into the bay. They will eat one ton of food per day and they want to create this big layer of fat that we call the blubber to survive here in these cold waters. Uh, the humbugs, they have the same body temperature as us and this water is like 6 degrees. So when the summer is over, they migrate to warmer waters for the mating season and the journey uh, is quite long and then they swim all the way back here and while doing all of this, they are fasting, they don't eat almost at all so that's why this fat is a way to stock up a lot of energy to be able to do all of this and one ton of food per day, it might seem quite normal for such big animals, they are between 10 to 18 meters but one ton of food per day, even for them, in proportion, proportion, it's like if we humans would eat 8 pizzas per day, then we would be very fat, so that's what they are doing. How long is the diving time? So, the diving time is important because the waves, when they are breathing, they come up for a few breaths. It can be only one breath if we are not lucky. Or it can be a few breaths so we don't we have time to see it. And then it will go for a dive. At the dive, usually we don't wait more than 10 minutes and then it comes up again. It took a bit of patience, but we eventually saw the graceful majestic creatures blow their water high into the air, lift and lower their white tails into the sea as they dive deep and disappear for several minutes. While I saw a blue whale in the distance, most of the whales in the bay were the slightly smaller humpback whales with their characteristic tails. I came at the right time. The summer months are the best time to see whales, as this is when the migratory whale species arrive from the breeding grounds near the equator and benefit from the long daylight hours and the rich menu of fish in the waters around Iceland. Okay, so this one is not shy, coming closer to the boat, because we're not moving. It's a big white flippers on the side. That's very typical of the humpbacks. They have the biggest flippers of all the whales. The tail that you saw was white with the middle part black so as i said this is different for every humpback so that's how we recognize individuals some have completely black tails some completely white or white with some patches of black or black with some white drawings After about two hours and close to a dozen whale sightings, we headed back to the shores of Husavik. What an incredible experience this had been. I briefly stopped at the well-curated local whale museum where, amongst others, a 22 meter long skeleton of a blue whale is on display. The museum was a great place to learn more about these gentle giants of the seas and I particularly enjoyed the photo exhibition of local whale watching guide and marine photographer Alas Mucha who captured some of the most amazing shots of whales as part of his excursions.
as I left Tuzawik, I stopped at the outskirts of town where I went for a walk through the vast and colorful fields of lupine that spread as far as the eye could see. Passing seemingly endless wooden scaffolding that is traditionally used to hang fish to dry, I joined some Icelandic horses to appreciate the magnificent purple blossoms of Iceland's iconic arctic flowers. This is so beautiful here. Look at the scenery. And I'm all by myself. And this is a beautiful walking trail here, just south of Husavik. So if you go whale watching, make sure you also check out these beautiful fields. After this rejuvenating walk, I continued my journey heading back south to my next destination of the day, the famous lake region of Mevatn, a location many locals consider the most beautiful in all of Iceland. About 2300 years ago, Lake Mevatn came into existence following a large basaltic lava eruption. As the hot lava flowed into water basins, the meeting of the elements resulted in steam explosions which created the distinctive landscape, including the pseudo craters, lava pillars, lava fields and hot springs that can be found in the area. The lava flows also blocked the natural drainage path of the water, which led to the formation of Lake Mivatn. Today, Mivatn is one of the largest lakes in Iceland, covering an area of about 37 square kilometers, about 14 square miles. With an average depth of about 2.5 meters, or 8 feet, the lake is, however, quite shallow. Lake Mivatn translates to Midges Lake, making reference to the millions of small mosquito-like creatures that swarm around the lake in the summer months. Unlike mosquitoes, however, the midges here don't bite humans and are at best a mild swarming nuisance. Despite the heavy winds that suddenly blew over the lake, I decided to take a walk across the craters. I couldn't help but marvel at the incredible beauty of the place uniquely shaped by the raw natural forces of nature. Mivatn is also known for its adjacent geothermal area. The bright varying tones of earth colors that made up the surrounding hills invited me to take another walk. The scenery was mesmerizing as the red earth contrasted with the lush purple and green of yet more fields of lupines. Just a stone throw further east, I stopped at the vast geothermal field of Querier. This unique place is famous for its bubbling pools of mud and steaming fumaroles emitting sulfuric gas. It is a feast for the eyes, but challenges one's olfactory senses. The acidic fumes of sulfur emit strong odors that are reminiscent of rotten eggs. But despite the less than pleasant smell of the actively hissing and bubbling nature around me, I was enarmored by the truly unique landscape that did not remotely resemble anything I'd ever seen. I felt catapulted on a remote planet. Nothing seemed familiar, and yet I was witnessing the only barely tamed forces that came from 1000 meters deep inside the planet up to the surface. Down there, the temperature is above 200 degrees Celsius or 1832 degrees Fahrenheit. The water that flows below the ground gets boiling hot and comes back up to the surface as hot steam. I walked across the mystifying landscape that was riddled with fissures and cracks, gaping gray holes that bubble and gurgle hot mud, endlessly steaming fumaroles, 
and crystallized slurry crusts of sulfur framed by yellowish-green, white and red rock. After a while, my nose signaled me that it was time to move away from the repulsive odor of rotten eggs and I decided to continue my journey up into the nearby volcanic mountains of Krafla. Accompanied by heavy winds, I stopped at the impressive Viti crater that features an icy emerald green crater lake. It owes its vivid coloration to some volcanic elements brought up by the geothermal activity that reflect sun rays in a particular spectrum of light. I took the short but somewhat strenuous walk up along the outer edges of the volcano, which reveals stunning views down into the 21 and 30 feet deep caldera. This crater is part of the massive Krafla caldera that is about 10 kilometers or 7 miles wide, with an even more expensive zone of fissures that extends for 90 kilometers or 56 miles. The volcano is considered to be still active and has erupted 29 times since Iceland's first settlers arrived. Ever since, Krafla has had a reputation as an unpredictable and dangerous volcanic system. It last erupted in September 1984, but probes taken in 2006 revealed a vast amount of lava bubbling at a mere 2,000 meters, roughly one mile deep below the surface of the earth. I think Iceland uh, is the windiest place I've ever been to, but it's absolutely amazing. I truly enjoy the walks here. I think this is the first time I'm climbing up a volcano. So, there's lots of firsts for me here in Iceland. Just a stone throw away from the Viti crater, I entered the large lava field of Leandjukar, at which end I was about to see one of the most impressive volcanic geothermal landscapes I had ever seen. Walking over wooden planks that led through the frozen lava field that was gently covered by enchanting swaths of green moss sprinkled by cushion pink flowers, a small mountain dwelling wildflower that is common here in Iceland. But quickly the scenery changed and large bubbling mud pools, hot springs and fuming lava fields emerged. As I hiked further up the mountain, the hissing and bubbling of the geothermal activity here provided the soundtrack for a truly spectacular view. A seemingly endless landscape of volcanic fissures, solidified lava streams and surreal basalt formations. The scenery felt awe-inspiring, extraterrestrial and somewhat intimidating. But at the same time, I could not get enough of the incredible views that provided the backdrop of this otherworldly experience. I had planned only a short visit here, but ended up spending hours walking along the narrow paths that led through the surreal terrain, at times even forgetting the strong and repulsive odor of sulfuric hot steams that fumed out of crevices between volcanic rocks. At the end of one of the trails, I found myself at the center of a small crater, which must have been the central site of the most recent eruption.
This is one of the most incredible places I've ever been to. Such a spooky atmosphere. And there's nobody around. I'm all by myself here. Highlight of my trip. This is such a cool place. You have to check that out when you're in Iceland. And after all this rain and muddy weather, the mighty wind has blown it away and has made room for the sun. The weather in Iceland is truly unpredictable. During my short time in this country, I had experienced thunderstorms, heavy rainfall, glorious sunshine, and hurricane-like winds, paired with at times extremely cold and then again warm and soothing temperatures. Often all occurred within hours of the same day. As I was driving towards my next destination, the sky started to turn into a milky mustard yellow, and almost out of nowhere, I found myself in the middle of a sandstorm. The sun found it harder and harder to penetrate the thick layers of whirling dust, covering the scenery in layers of tiny particles. The atmosphere was both gloomy and intimidating, but also mesmerizing, calming and just beautiful. I eventually reached Detifoss, yet another nature spectacle that can only be found in Iceland. It's windy in Iceland! <laughs> This is so much fun! Situated in Batnajökull National Park in northeast Iceland, Dedifoss is said to be the second most powerful waterfall in Europe after the Rhine Falls in Switzerland. The falls are 100 meters, about 330 feet wide, and have a drop of 44 meters, about 144 feet, down to the canyon. The sediment-rich runoff stems from the Vatnajökull glacier and colors the water light grayish white. The waterfalls were truly impressive, and the rumbling and hissing of the brute force of the water masses was awe-inspiring. But I just as much enjoyed the moon-like scenery around the falls, with the alien basalt columns and rock formations artistically set in scene by the soft light of the never-ending evening sun. Pushing my body against the heavy windstorm, I reflected back on this incredible day that led me from Godafoss to a whale-watching tour to an enchanting lake, geothermal fields, active volcanic areas, all the way here to this incredible scenery. No place in the world could offer such a variety of nature spectacles in a single day. I took the last drive of the day to my night quarters in the remote hamlet of Mithrudalur, where I quickly fell asleep. The next morning greeted me with sunshine. My plan for today was to drive to one of the most picturesque canyons of Iceland, the ravine of Strudlagil in Jökuldalur. Strudlagil literally translates to basalt columns, and this nature sensation in the eastern region of Iceland may present the most impressive columnar basalt rock formations that can be found anywhere in the world. I first took the gravel road on the northern side of the deep canyon, passing numerous sheep farms that lined the rolling valley along the way. The road opened to a cliff, from where a steep set of iron stairs led down to a narrow viewing platform that overlooked the canyon. From there, I had a breathtaking view of the astounding symmetrical basalt columns that were carved by nature over time. But there was an even better way to explore the canyon, for which I had to drive to the southern side of the valley, passing a narrow bridge to a parking platform from where I embarked on a nice 10 km hike along the southern cliffs of the valley. It was hard to believe that, until just 15 years ago, this majestic canyon was completely submerged under the ferociously flowing murky brown sedimented glacial waters of the river Jökla that ran through the ravine and divided Jökuldalur valley into two parts. 
Farmers and villagers on either side were completely cut off from each other and nobody thought about the hidden beauty below the fierce waters of Jekla. But in 2009, the Kauran Jukar Dam and hydropower plant was built. The dam was controversial because of its negative environmental impact, but it caused the water level to decrease by 7 to 8 meters, up to 26 feet, which revealed the canyon in all its glory. I walked down to the river, which was now a force of clarity in vibrant turquoise color, and I was in awe looking up the majestic rock formations that stand 30 meters, about 98 feet tall, at times standing straight and in other sections forming beautifully twisted geometric patterns that reminded me of enormous snail houses carved into the rock by ancient Icelandic giants. But there's a scientific explanation for this wondrous phenomenon. According to geologists, these hexagonal columns are formed in a process called columnar jointing. When basaltic lava flows and cools slowly over time, it contracts and separates into columnar symmetrical joints. These shapes, mostly hexagons, stand vertically on the lava surface, clustered together to form the slender columns I could now see with my own eyes. On the way to my next destination, I spotted the traditional turf houses of Kjartarhargi. For centuries, and up to the 1970s, the outhouses of this traditional farm were part of a cluster of six buildings, but many got demolished when the new road number one was built 40 years ago. Today, the two old sheep houses are the only ones standing and are now under supervision of the Cultural Heritage Agency of Iceland. The buildings are entirely made of turf, stone and wood, and the characteristic roofs aligned with brushwood under a cover of turf. I went inside and was able to see the single feeding line arrangement of the sheep farmhouses. Not far from it, I strolled over to another heritage building, an old smithy that is said to have been built as a Catholic church and transformed into a smithy during the time of the Reformation in 1550. It was fascinating to see the traditional architecture that has been completely restored to its original form. When I reached the next highlight of my Iceland tour, the day had already advanced to the late afternoon. But daytime is relative in the summer months here, and I was ready to embark on a relatively short but rather steep and strenuous hike to two major waterfalls in the eastern region of the country. I first reached Lidlanisfoss, which is notable for the columnar jointed volcanic basalt columns that frame it to both sides like a gigantic amphitheater. The views from the upper cliffs onto this part of the gorge were stunning, and I could feel the fine vibrations in the air caused by the deep roaring of the waterfall that drops 30 meters down into the canyon. But Lannisfoss should just be the visual hors d'oeuvre for Hengifoss, one of the most unique and mesmerizing waterfalls on the island. Walking along the trail that leads to the waterfall and crossing bridges with wooden planks, I admired the scenery, which was a true feast for the eyes.
Dropping 120 meters down from a high mountain plateau, Hengifoss is the third highest waterfall in Iceland. What makes it so special are the wondrous basaltic strata with thin red layers of clay that break the pattern of the basaltic layers. The red layers are fossilized remains of coniferous tree trunks, soil and iron compounds dating back to the warmer climates during the latter part of the tertiary era several million years ago. Each time another layer of lava flowed over the acidic soil, the iron of the soil reacted with the oxygen, resulting in the reddish colors of the layers. To further accentuate the effects, the glowing lava burned the upper part of the soil and colored it in deep red. Nature outdid itself here, creating this monumental piece of art which can now be visited on a narrow but well-paved trail. It was astounding to see how the water cut deep into the mountain over time, forming this spectacular canyon. Unfortunately, it was time for me to leave the beautiful landscapes of eastern Iceland, which are enamored with incredible natural wonders. But the good news was, I was heading to the south coast, brimming with the many famous natural landmarks that turned the country into a prime destination for travelers. But first, I had to drive through Oxy Pass, an unpaved mountain pass lined with dramatic cliffs and vast stretches of scrub-covered highlands that was suddenly engulfed in thick clouds. The drive was quite an adventure. At times, the visibility ahead of me was so poor that I could only see two to three meters of road before it disappeared into the thick, heavy grayish white fog. To make matters worse, heavy rain started to settle in, which only cleared up as I reached one of the lesser known waterfalls in Iceland, Folaldafoss. And Folaldafoss was truly a hidden gem, surrounded by the breathtaking nature of the Axarvergur mountains to the north and a view of the East Fjords coastline to the south. This waterfall impressively drops about 20 meters down from a rapture in the rocks carved into the volcanic basalt. I stood in awe and felt lucky to have this peaceful place all to myself. I continued my journey down to the coastline where the heavy clouds continued to darken the midsummer night sky. It was past midnight when I reached my last stop of the day, the scenic black sand beach of Reykjavik with its monumental black basalt sea stack. This beach is another paradise for seabirds and I saw hundreds of puffins flying by in the distance, likely returning home from extensive fishing expeditions. Closer to me, seagulls were observing the scenery, unimpressed by the agitated waves that were hitting on the rocks around them. A family of sheep paid a visit before they disappeared in the dunes and even an arctic fox hastily hushed by. Soaking in the fresh air, I sat on the beach, indulging in the harmonious atmosphere of the East Fjord scenery around me.
but it was time to call it a day. I drove a few additional kilometers to my night quarters and quickly fell asleep. The next morning, thick clouds, heavy winds, paired with light rainfall awaited me in Stocksnes as I drove down to the coast. But this did not deter me from going on a walking tour on this picturesque peninsula with the iconic Westrahorn Mountain as its backdrop. The Stocksnes Peninsula has an interesting history stretching back to the 9th century, providing the location for one of the country's first settlements. During World War II, this place served as a vital location for the British Army. Today, the land is privately owned by a local farmer and visitors can explore the area for a small fee. The dramatic picturesque landscape and grasslands have become home for a Viking village that was built as a movie set featuring wooden structures with grass roofs reminiscent of traditional Icelandic turf houses. The intricately carved door frames, weathered buildings and dispersed animal skulls and skeletons turn this abandoned village into a somewhat gloomy but very photogenic place. Further down from the village, the rough coastal shores are home to numerous birds and I spotted colonies of arctic terns and kittiwakes fishing and diving in the ice-cold waters. Arctic terns are slender grey and white birds with a black cap and angular wings and are well known for their long yearly migration. It's hard to imagine, but every year these small birds travel from their breeding grounds here in Iceland all the way to Antarctica where they enjoy their Antarctic summer covering an incredible 25,000 miles. On my way back inland, I came across some oyster catchers with their long orange-red bills wading through the vast wetlands. These noisy plover-like birds use their massive long bills to smash or pry open mollusks and catch worms. Oyster catchers are monogamous, but not necessarily the best parents. They are known to practice egg dumping and at times lay their eggs in the nests of other species such as seagulls, abandoning them to be raised by those birds. Not very impressed by their parenting skills, I rushed back to the car as heavy rain started to set in again. As it was nearing Iceland's largest national park around the majestic Vatnajökull volcano, which is now covered by massive glaciers, a heavy storm set in, pounding water masses against the car. Iceland's weather again showed itself from its most unpredictable side. While the blustering winds eventually blew away the clouds, the Icelandic weather service deemed the wind gusts too heavy for cars to withstand their power and closed a section of the ring road, the only passageway along the southern coast. As I joined dozens of other cars that were stuck waiting for the authorities to open the road again, I marveled at a beautiful rainbow that formed over the southern end of the national park. And after some of the heaviest rainstorm I had ever experienced, out of nowhere, the sun was forcing its way back through the clouds. It was surreal how quickly the weather changed in Iceland. Eventually the police opened the road again and I headed straight to Svina Fettelsjökatl glacier. This glorious glacier that is part of the Skafta Fettel nature reserve is made up of many sharp ridges that while not possible to climb on, showcased a mesmerizing shimmering of blue coloration with gleaming white snow and veins of black ash that are memories of eruptions from centuries past. The beauty of the site was captured on film during Game of Thrones' dramatic battle of the penultimate episode of season 7. As I was walking along the shores of the glacier lake, I was reminded that the icebergs floating on the lake were literally only the tips of much larger structures underneath. The glacier valley here is about 200 meters deep and only 10% of the icebergs are visible to the eye. The water here had a dull brown color caused by the mud, silt, sand, ash, sediments and gravel that the massive glacier reveals as it gradually retreats, revealing the lifeless land that was hidden below its surface. Right next to Svina Fettel's Jökatl, I continued my glacial explorations at the neighboring Skafta Fettel glacier. This impressive landscape has been shaped by the erosive power of outlet glaciers and glacier rivers. From a well-curated visitor center, I set out on two hikes that would allow me to get unique vantage points to see the glacier in all its beauty. First, I wandered along the foot of the mountain to explore the area close to the glacier lake. I was fascinated by the striking panorama that opened up around me, with icebergs floating on the lake, set and seen by the glistening sun that peeked over the mountain ridge. 
smaller glacial ice blocks got carved into fantastical shapes, some reminiscent of floating swans. This enchanting Nordic landscape was a feast for the eyes, further enhanced by a colorful rainbow in the distance. The sun finally came out, and it came out in full force, and I'm able to visit my first Icelandic glacier in the sunlight. Iceland doesn't cease to surprise, and it's true that you experience all kinds of seasons in just one day. And I'm just grateful to be able to experience this here. My second hike should prove to be more strenuous, as I set out to walk up the Suonanipa Trail, leading through birch forestry, roven trees, and thick scrubbery dotted with bluebells, yellow saxifrage, and alpine rock foil that cover the mountain. The trail sporadically opened up to fantastic views over Iceland's southern coastline. As I headed further up, I spotted a golden plover that chirped over the vast landscape of a mountain plateau. Golden plovers have a place in Icelandic folklore as the appearance of the first plover in the country means that spring has arrived, and each year national media cover the first plover sighting. I continued my hike to the main lookout over the rocks of Sionanipa. From here, I was able to get a view of the captivating vast landscape of the glacier below me. The dimensions of the glacier are enormous and awe-inspiring, but I also wondered how much longer such sights will be possible, as the glaciers here are rapidly retracting. Future generations may only see the so-called eternal ice on photos and videos. Contemplating about the ephemeral nature of this unique spectacle that I just witnessed, I continued my hike across the grasslands of the mountain plateau. I eventually reached a somewhat hidden Svartifoss, yet another captivating waterfall. Similar to Litlanisfoss, albeit smaller in size, this waterfall is also framed by sizable geometric basalt columns. I enjoyed the pristine moments at this captivating nature phenomenon to which the roaring of the water provided the perfect soundtrack. But it was again getting past midnight and I eventually set out to hike back down the mountain to find some sleep. The next day should bring about more amazing adventures as I further explore the spellbinding south coast of Iceland. The next morning I got up early as I had planned for an ambitious program of visits of natural wonders. And while Iceland has no shortage of densely packed landmarks and must-see destinations, I could not help but taking frequent spontaneous stops along the way to marvel at the scenery and the unexpected gifts nature had in store everywhere I looked.
the vast Gungulite um Eldran lava field was created in one of the greatest and most poisonous eruptions in recorded history and is one of the largest lava fields in the world. This eruption lasted two years from 1783 to 1784 and is known as the Skafta River fires. Eldran translates to fire lava and one can only imagine the terrifying power of this cataclysmic disaster for the island at the time. In Iceland, it led to crop failure, disease, famine and death. More than half of the domestic animals on the island were killed and many Icelanders had to migrate to Denmark to survive. But the enormous eruption affected Europe as well. In Great Britain, that summer is known as the Sand Summer, as the sky was darkened from the fallout of ash. Some historians even made the case that the airborne haze and blocking of sunlight may have indirectly contributed to the French Revolution. But despite the abysmal effect the eruption had at the time, this gigantic lava field now spans 565 square kilometers and features one of the most magnificent lava tube systems in the country. The field is riddled with sharp lava rocks, crevices and fissures, and more than 200 caves have been found here, extending for more than 5 kilometers. The lava rocks are now gently covered with whitish green moss sprinkled here and there with local white blossoms. The moss here took decades to grow and is part of a very fragile ecosystem. Walking on the lava field is therefore not allowed, but a viewing platform allows to get a perspective of the lava field and the ring road passes right through it. Interestingly, Eldron was also the place where the Apollo 11 crew trained for their impending moonwalk in 1969, as the unusual ground was considered similar to the surface of the moon. Just a few minutes drive from the lava field, I took a gravel road to yet another highlight of my trip, the enchanting Flatra Glufar Canyon. I parked my car above the canyon and took a small trail leading down to the edge of this magical place that seemed to have been created by trolls, fairies and elves. A grassy walking path leads along the edge of the 100 meter deep canyon, opening up to dramatic views to the floor that would make even the most experienced climbers dizzy. The walk has a total length of about 2 kilometers and leads to an iron viewing platform that overlooks the beautiful Moega Foss, which gushes its glacial waters into the abyss. Once a well-kept Icelandic secret, the canyon has recently gotten more prominence because it served as a location for a Justin Bieber music video and finding solitude here has become more difficult. What makes it so special are its oddly shaped salients and bumps dotted with soft grass and patches of moss and the many turning and twisting deep walls. The canyon was formed approximately 9000 years ago when the glacier retreated at the end of the last ice age. The melting water accumulated and a lake was believed to have formed in the valley behind the canyon. The sediment-rich runoff water from the lake flowed towards the ocean, gradually carving itself into the sediment layers and leaving behind the magical fairy tale like landscape around me. Taking a brief break with a herd of Icelandic sheep in the lowlands of the south coast, I passed the Skafta Fettel and Svina Fettel's Jökotl glaciers I had visited the day before and headed to my next stop at the small village of Hof. Here I found Iceland's last turf church ever built, the enchanting Hofskirkja. Originally constructed in 1884 and thoroughly restored in the 1950s, this unique turf church is still home to a practicing parish. The church structure is held by a timber skeleton filled with sturdy stone walls. It is topped by heavy stone slabs that are draped in a cloth of greenery which helps to keep the inside warm and protected against the often bitterly cold winters. The church is partially buried in the ground so the earth can act as an additional natural insulation and the roof melts into the landscape on both sides. The thick blanket of grass is only interrupted by small windows that peek through the greenery. This bewildering historical building is only one of six turf churches left in the country and maybe one of the most charming ones. I continued my journey along the ring road, heading to see some of the natural wonders I had to skip the day before due to the heavy rainfall. The weather today was much more pleasant and I decided to head onto the small gravel road that led towards the massive Vatnajökull mountain that dominates the entire landscape in this part of the island. I was heading to Fjallsjökull Glacier Lagoon, yet another unparalleled nature experience in a captivating yet tranquil scenery. Dreamlike glacial ice formations effortlessly floating on a pristine lake form the centerpieces of this distinctive topography that is framed by the enthralling Fjallsjökull glacier behind it. The panorama in front of me was breathtaking. 
Kjartal Jökull is one of the smaller glaciers that lead down from the main ice cap of Vatna Jökull, and it does not get the public attention some of its neighboring glaciers get. I had the entire scenery all to myself when I was there, strolling along the shores of the lagoon and resting on one of the volcanic rocks. Just when I thought I had seen it all, I was about to experience one of the most breathtaking sights of all of Iceland. The incredible glacial landscape of Jökulsárlón. It is hard to describe the scenery in words and even photos don't do it justice. The scenery around me, filled with floating ice formations that glistened in the evening sun, the quiet atmosphere that was just interrupted by the occasional cracking of ice blocks falling into the glacier lake, the multiple reflections of mountainscapes in the water bodies that acted as perfect mirrors of the icebergs in the glacier, all of this was mesmerizing and jaw-droppingly beautiful. I could not get enough of this magnificent and stunningly soothing panorama. The glacial waters of the lagoon flow into the ice-cold Nordic waters off the shores of the south coast. They carry small ice sculptures with them, of which many float into the open sea, but some make it ashore and are scattered as shimmering diamonds on the adjacent black sand beach. This phenomenon has given the very fitting name to this beautiful sandy seaboard, the Diamond Beach. Ice-cold winds set in again as the evening light gradually dimmed around me, but I strolled along the beach, marveling at the artistic yet ephemeral creations nature left behind on the sands. I eventually forced myself back to the car to take the journey to my night quarters of the day. On the way, I passed more enchanting landscapes as continuous reminders of the incredible nature Iceland has to offer. After several hours of driving, I reached the southern town of Vík. Vík is famous for its black sand beaches that are not to be missed on any Iceland trip. 
This part of the island is particularly popular with visitors and can get rather busy during the daytime. I therefore decided to take a midnight stroll on the beach, finding myself all alone with the heavy waves gushing on the black sand. Another amazing day in Iceland had come to an end. I woke up early in the morning to head to Solheimer Fjara, a large and white black sand beach on which the famous Solheimer plane wreck found its last rest. It's a popular landmark and photo spot which attracts hundreds of visitors every day in the summer months. To get there and have an unobstructed view of the airplane, I took the long walk along the flat, empty, rocky stone field that cannot be accessed by car. During the day, a tour bus takes visitors to the plane, but early in the morning such an option was not available. After about an hour walk, I finally spotted the remains of the Douglas C-117D ahead of me. Back in 1973, the US Navy aircraft was flying from Hofen Airport to the Naval Air Station in Keflavik, when it suffered from severe icing, forcing the crew to land on a frozen river at Solheimer Sandor. Luckily, all seven crew members survived and were rescued by helicopter, but the aircraft was written off and left at the scene. Up to today, it's in remarkable shape and has withstood the rough elements of the past half century. My next stop were the equally popular cliffs at Dierhole, right above Vik. Dierhole, which translates to Door Hill Island, is of volcanic origin and was once an island before joining up to the Icelandic mainland. Its main feature is a giant rock arc that is the result of centuries of erosion, but it is most known for its historic lighthouse and an abundance of bird life that can be spotted here. Eider ducks, puffins, gulls and falmars call the dramatic cliffs here their home during the summer months and some come surprisingly close despite the hustle and bustle of the hundreds of visitors on the panoramic promenade. From here, I also had a great view of the black sand beaches of Reinisfjara and the massive sea stacks of Reinisdrangar that contrast with the glittering waves of the Atlantic. After a short drive further west, I reached the famous Skogafoss. With a width of 25 meters, about 82 feet, and a drop of 60 meters, it is one of the biggest waterfalls in the country. The amount of spray the waterfall consistently produces is remarkable, and a visit here requires waterproof clothing to avoid getting drenched to the core. According to an Icelandic legend, the first Viking settler in the area, Thrasi Thorolson, buried a treasure in a cave behind the waterfall and locals found the chest years later, but were only able to grasp the ring on the side of the chest before it disappeared again. The ring was allegedly given to the local church where it served as a door ring and which can now be admired at the Skogar Museum. I took the hiking trail at the eastern side of the waterfall, climbing up the 527 flights of stairs, which eventually led me to a viewing platform from where I had a fantastic view of the edge of the waterfall and the entire coastal panorama below. Back on the ring road, I made a stop at the peculiar rock of Drangurin in Drangslid. This rock formation, with caves and turf-covered farmhouses below it, plays an interesting role in Icelandic folklore. According to legend, Elves lived in these rocks and helped cows in the cowsheds give birth to calves while the farmers were asleep at night. Some elf women were even said to have married farmers who would then disappear and happily live with them inside the mountains. Today, some of the old turf houses can still be visited. They stand as reminders of the mysterious tales that allegedly took place here.
Not far behind the Wondrous Rock, the ring road opens up to a wider lowland that emerges behind a larger water body. At the outer edge of the Cutler Mountain, I made a right turn to visit Seljalandsfoss. This enthralling waterfall is one of the very few that can be visited from behind. A small walkway takes brave visitors to a narrow passage that provides an unexpected perspective of the waterfall. I was of course ready for the rather wet experience and after just a few minutes found myself staring in awe at the roaring water masses that gushed down with brute force just in front of me, revealing the panorama of the coastal landscape behind. As I drove through the village of Kvalsvetlar, I decided to pay a visit to the lava center which offered some fascinating insights into the volcanic origins of Iceland. With past and current observations on seismic activity and the geologic idiosyncrasies of the fascinating landscapes I had seen over the past week. I spent the night at a nearby farmhouse as a close neighbor of the famous Icelandic horses that are a must see when visiting the country. Icelandic horses are friendly and warm natured to people, which is likely an inheritance from their days at the heart of Viking clans. Iceland's horses are a pure breed and the state maintains laws preventing horses that were exported from the country from being returned. The next morning I took the short drive from my night quarters in the very south of the island to yet another nature spectacle I was eager to witness. My destination was the volcanic landscape of the Grimsnes area. The most popular natural monument here is Kerith Crater. What makes Kerith quite special is its unique red volcanic rock coloration, the steep walls on all sides, the opaque and strikingly vivid aquamarine color of the crater lake and the overall impressively intact caldera which can be visited on a steep foot trail. The caldera itself is approximately 55 meters or 180 feet deep and up to 270 meters or almost 900 feet wide. Geologically, Kerith is quite young, only about 6500 years old. It is only half the age of most of the volcanoes in the area, such as Thedis Holar and Ker Hortl. What makes Kerith also different from most volcanoes I had seen so far is that it was not formed by a huge volcanic explosion, but rather an eruption that emptied the volcano's magma reserve, which then caused the cone to collapse into the empty chamber. Curious about the scenery beyond the crater, I ventured out on a walk in the wider area, discovering even more impressive volcanic terrain. The deep red and orange colors of the volcanic earth and the distinctive patterns that nature had crafted into the rocks was mesmerizing. Unfortunately, the sky darkened and heavy rain set in, forcing me to take a short pause in a nearby crater turned quarry turned private dump site. But as quickly as the rains appeared, as quickly they passed again and I was ready to head to a long-awaited adventure. I was finally driving into the infamous Icelandic highlands. My destination was one of the most distinctive places of the country, the magical landscape of Landmanna Laugar. But getting there would not be for the faint-hearted. While the initial route towards the southern highlands is mostly paved, this eventually changes into an extremely rough F-road a gravel road that is riddled with deep fissures, potholes and extruding rocks. Only authorized 4x4 vehicles are allowed to be taken on the F-roads and for good reason. It would be impossible to get to Landmannalaugar with a regular two-wheel drive car. Due to Iceland's ever-changing weather conditions, the road is usually only open between the summer months of June and September. With all this being said, the drive was one of the most beautiful of my entire trip. I was passing awe-inspiring landscapes and sceneries that could have come right out of a science fiction movie. The rugged terrain, contrasting colors, unusual rock formations sprinkled with volcano craters and deep water bodies seemed unreal. Nevertheless, I was here and saw it all with my own eyes.
After what seemed like an almost eternal drive, I finally reached the river that separated the road from the small camping settlement of Landmannerlaugar. Some vehicles with high clearance dared to take the drive through the river, but I decided to not further test my luck and take the remaining distance on foot, crossing the river via a newly built pedestrian bridge. Landmanner Laugar lies on the edge of the Laugaron Lava Field, which was formed by a volcanic eruption in the 15th century. The valley is encircled by colorful windswept mountains that contrast with the obsidian, raven black lava fields. The magma in this area contains a mineral called rhyolite, which creates a full spectrum of dazzling colors with shades of red, pink, golden yellow, orange, green, and light blue. The area here is known for its geothermal activity and its natural hot spring baths, and Landmanner Laugar literally translates to people's pools. For centuries, it served as an area of shelter and refuge for weary travelers who used the soothing springs as a means to relax after tiring excursions. But I felt everything by tired. Quite on the contrary, I was eager to embark on my hike through the distinctive black lava fields and wondrous landscapes that presented themselves all around me. Mesmerized by the stunning rock formations and aesthetically unusual scenery, I followed the narrow trail all the way to the hissing and steaming fumaroles that emitted the sulfuric gas I had already witnessed in other geothermal areas. I could not help but think about the terrifying and intimidating power of the geological activity hundreds of meters below my feet. And yet, this ethereal location was clearly another major highlight of my trip. For my last day in Iceland, I had planned an ambitious tour as the grand finale of my trip. Saying goodbye to the Icelandic horses in the farm where I had stayed for the night, my plan was to first cover the major remaining highlights of the famous Golden Circle before heading out onto the F roads of the remote highlands again. My first stop was at the Geysir geothermal area of Haukadalur. In a country not short of breathtaking nature spectacles, this one was another must see. While much of the area was not unlike the Querier geothermal area I had witnessed in northern Iceland, it is home to a special phenomenon that makes it unique in the world, the Strokhar geyser. A geyser is a phenomenon where water is dramatically ejected from below the surface high into the sky. This is caused by molten magma that is sufficiently close to the surface of the earth to make the rock hot enough to boil water. As glacial water drains from Langjökull glacier pass close by below the surface, the geyser gets a constant water supply which gets heated by magma. A conduit carries the water to a natural reservoir with a silica lining that prevents the water from draining away. Nowadays, Strokhar is the world's most active geyser and naturally erupts every 4 to 10 minutes, gushing steaming hot water up to 30 meters, about 100 feet into the air. Strokhar has a more famous sibling, the original geyser, the namesake of the geyser phenomenon. Geyser translates to something like the one who gushes and scientists have been able to trace back geothermal activity here to about 10,000 years ago. But the geyser appearance was first mentioned in literature in 1294, and it has been active on and off ever since. In recent years, however, the original geyser has become dormant as earthquakes clog the water conduit. At an incredible height of up to 122 meters, about 400 feet, its eruptions were, however, much higher than those of Strokhor today. But as just a small earthquake can quickly change things again, I felt blessed to be able to witness this unique phenomenon along with the continuous bubbling and fuming of the geothermal pools, hot springs and fumaroles with the characteristic rotten egg odor of the sulfuric steams all around me. Butelfoss. This thunderous waterfall is without a doubt the most popular and best known waterfall in Iceland. A sightseeing fixture along the famous Golden Circle, it is located in the Kvita River Canyon, not too far away from the Geysir geothermal area of Haukadalur. I was able to spot it from afar by the agglomeration of dozens of buses that carried visitors to the site. Popularity clearly came at a price. Gutelfoss translates to Golden Falls and there are two legends connecting to the name. One says that an old Viking dumped his gold treasure into the waterfall so that no one could enjoy it after his day. 
The other says that the name originates from the rainbows above the waterfall on sunny days. No matter which origin, this iconic waterfall is impressive. It plunges a total of 31 meters, about 105 feet, in a series of cascades. The canyon walls on both sides of the waterfall reach heights of up to 70 meters, 230 feet, dramatically descending into the Great Guttelfors Glufor Canyon. Geologists believe that this canyon was carved by glacial runoff at the beginning of the last ice age. I joined the crowds and walked along the designated trails to the various viewing platforms from where I witnessed firsthand the 140 cubic meters, about 460 cubic feet of glacial water surging down the cliffs at every second. It is noteworthy that in the early 20th century, Godolfos was only barely saved by a courageous local sheep farm daughter by the name of Sigridur Thomas Dottier. She fought a long and arduous battle against an English businessman who had acquired a land lease from her dad to use the waterfall as the basis for an hydroelectric plant. In 1929, Sigridur's tenacity ultimately prevailed and her lawyer, Swain Bjornsson, later became the first president of an independent Iceland in 1944. While I enjoyed my visit to Gottelfoss, I made a mental note to not come here again during the daytime hours. The busloads of tourists squeezed tightly into the visitor centers and all around the falls somewhat took away from the otherwise great experience. I was ready for a bit more solitude again and embarked on the lonely gravel F-roads to my next destination, the Rainbow Mountains of Kalingafjotl. The highlands of Iceland are located on an uninhabited plateau that covers most of the interior of the country. It is considered to be one of the most remote areas of the country and even figures among the largest uninhabited wilderness regions of all of Europe. The 40,000 square kilometer region I was touching is characterized by unearthly landscapes and magical serenity, a remote and harsh place of silence and nature at its rawest. The road led me across the barren landscapes between the glaciers Langjukötl and Höfsjukötl. While still on a rough gravel road, the road conditions seemed somewhat better than those I had experienced the day before on my way to Landmannalaugar. As I reached closer to my destination, I stopped at a beautiful canyon with dramatic walls of blackish-brown volcanic rock that was covered with patches of bright green shimmering moss and remainders of snow. The canyon offered magnificent views into the deep riverbed that flowed in sharp twists and turns along the valley. In one instance, the river flowed around a steep hill, reminding me of the meandering flows of the river in Uvac Canyon in Serbia. The gravel roads should soon start to deteriorate and it became more challenging to navigate the steep slopes and turns of the mountain road. But eventually, I made it to the end of the road at Kellingafjordl. I was immediately struck by the captivating beauty of this precious landscape. What a contrast to the busy scene at Gudelfoss earlier. This multicolored mountain range was truly off the beaten path and I only saw a few other solitude seekers and adventurous spirits that were equally awestruck by the unique volcanic landscape here. I took the steep, slippery, muddy red trail down into the valley, cautiously taking one step at a time to not fall and slide down the grimy, wet slopes. What was unfolding in front of me was nothing short of spectacular. I entered an almost unreal landscape of color-changing rhyolite mountains splattered with fuming plumes, clay geysers, misty hot springs and boiling mud puddles. This unique fantasy world that was sunk into an ethereal sea of steam looked as if it came from the mind of a divine artist. I walked along the plethora of marked hiking trails, cross bridges over water bodies, wading over wooden walkways, tracing up and down muddy slopes and immersing myself in this dreaming world. Mm -hmm. 
Kalinga Fjordel is part of a large volcano system created by an enormous eruption about 10,000 years ago at the end of the last ice age. And up to today, it is one of the most active geothermal areas of Iceland. Similar to Landmannalaugar, this wondrous scenery is made out of rhyolite rock, which over time has colored the mountains in multiple hues of rusty red. The coloration is further accentuated by scattered minerals that painted the volcanic rocks in various shades of green, pink, red and yellow. The colors are contrasted by snowy patches along the mountain ridges that even now in the summer months refuse to melt away. Mesmerized by the constantly changing color of the hills in the passing light, the smooth valleys that were scattered with tough stone pillars and the dramatically rising towers of steam, I spent several hours exploring this fairy tale landscape that provided such a profound perspective on the majesty of nature. What a spectacular highlight on my last day here on the islands. But my trip would have been incomplete without paying a visit to my next destination, for which I traced my path back southwest in the direction of the Reykjanes Peninsula. I was heading to the world-famous Thingvellir National Park, a UNESCO World Heritage Site. This extraordinary location is where the North American and Eurasian tectonic plates collide and a continuous friction produces daily micro-earthquakes. It is the only place in the world where the rift is above sea level and nowhere one can see the edges of both plates as clear as in Thingvellir. It was a fascinating experience walking along the Almanagia Gorge, the edge of the North American plate, from where I had a great view over the valley below and the Eurasian wall behind it. This valley between the two tectonic plates, now innocently covered in lush green vegetation and deep blue water bodies, was the Mid-Atlantic Rift Valley that became visible to the naked eye. The tectonic plates move apart about 2.5 centimeters every year and have done so for thousands of years. Magma welled up as the continent spread filling the space with lava fields and ravines ripped open by centuries of earthquakes. Contemplating about this grand geological theater, I stopped at a charming waterfall called Uxara Foss, from where I explored the other, equally stunning side of this unique park. Thingvellir is not only a place where literally earth-shattering geological processes can be witnessed at first hand, it is also in many ways the cradle of democracy. Thingvellir translates directly to the fields of parliament. And in these volcanic rock mountains, the Althingi, an open-air assembly representing all clans of Iceland, was established in 930 when over 30 ruling chiefs met for the first time to establish a commonwealth and where the, at the time, deeply divided clans continued to meet all the way until 1798, when it paused for 45 years due to Danish colonialism. Over two weeks each year, this historical assembly set laws as a covenant between free men and settled disputes. No one person ruled the entire parliament and its de facto head only held ceremonial powers as all decisions were made collectively. The annual meetings were very ad hoc, with people from all around the country only building temporary shelters and dismantling them at the end of the meeting. Therefore, there is unfortunately little evidence of its historical significance. But looking closely, I could still make out some old foundations and fragments hidden beneath the grassland. The Althingi is where the history of the nation truly began and it has deep historical and symbolic value for the people of Iceland up to today. It was here where the nation abandoned Asatru, the old Norse pagan belief system, and replaced it with Christianity in the year 1000 AD. Nearly a millennium later, in 1944, it was here where Icelanders declared their independence from Denmark and confirmed their first president. In hindsight, the early Icelanders created a rudimentary version of a modern-day representative parliament as a contrast to absolute monarchy about 800 years before such ideas came into play in the US and France. The Althingi eventually moved from Thingvellir to Reykjavik, where it continues today. It was fascinating to see the original site of the world's longest running and still ongoing parliament, marked by a stone amphitheater and a large Icelandic flag. As I reflected on the fascinating cultural and historical heritage of this cradle of medieval parliamentary Norse culture, it started to sink in that my Iceland trip was slowly coming to an end. I had to head to the airport 
return my car and catch my late evening flight back home. While sad that I had to leave this breathtakingly beautiful country, I also felt a deep sense of gratitude that I was able to experience the multitude of incredible natural wonders and spectacular moments. They will be deeply ingrained in my memory as some of the most magnificent reminders how raw, fragile and beautiful our planet is. Will I come back? I can safely answer that question with a resounding yes. I still want to take a bath in the Blue Lagoon, see the Nordic lights in the Icelandic winter sky and maybe, just maybe, get the opportunity to witness a live volcano eruption. But that will be the story for another time.